talking earlier about the fact that you recently wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal questioning the SEC's approach to the crypto market for not providing sufficient clarity over crypto regulation. Can you elaborate on that a bit and explain why you believe the current crypto regulatory approach actually does more harm than good? Yeah. So um, that since December of 2020, and that's an important day because the SEC filed a lawsuit against Ripple in December 2020, uh, we have not signed a single U.S. customer to our platform. But in the past two years, we've had the strongest years ever as a company. That $10 billion in volume mostly is driven offshore. And by the way, this is all done compliant with anti-money laundering laws, um, OFAC laws, anti-sanction laws, et cetera. Why is that? Why haven't we signed a single U.S. customer in the past two years? Because of regulatory uncertainty and really regulatory hostility. So the uh, piece that I wrote in the Wall Street Journal was in response to an op-ed that our current chair of the SEC wrote, Gary Gensler, where he announced that the SEC was going to be the cop on the beat for crypto. Well, I don't remember anyone holding an election for the cop on the beat for crypto. I don't remember Congress appointing Gary Gensler is the cop on the beat for crypto. So I wrote an editorial basically saying, you can't self-anoint your, you can't self-appoint yourself as the cop on a beat for crypto. And what really is happening here in the US, because we have such regulatory uncertainty and outright regulatory hostility through what we call regulation by enforcement, compared to sophisticated economic centers like Singapore, like London, like Dubai, um, what we're doing here in the US, and I think principally through the SEC as an institution, is we're elevating politics and power over sound policy. And in doing that, you're not only hurting innovation and innovators and entrepreneurs like Ripple, and I won't name others, but there's others under attack and, uh, in the space in the US, but ultimately you're hurting the retail holder of this asset. One in five Americans have either hold, own, or have interacted with crypto. And that uncertainty ultimately hurts them. So when you hear the chair of the SEC saying, I'm doing this all in the name of consumer protection, actually, it's the very opposite. It's the consumer that's getting hurt. And the day the SEC sued Ripple, um, the digital asset that we rely upon to effectuate the cross-border transactions, XRP, was delisted or suspended from trading from nearly every U.S. platform in the U.S. and $15 billion in market cap volume was erased. Did Ripple get hurt? Our business moved offshore. Who got hurt? The men and women who owned XRP in the U.S., who've been locked out of their accounts and can't access XRP in the U.S. If I could just give one more example. In Gary Gensler's editorial, he talked about a settlement with BlockFi, a lending platform, and what a great success that was. What happened? They settled with BlockFi, and they said, if you want to be a lending platform, you have to come in and register with the SEC. For those who are paying attention, we kind of all knew there was no path to registration with the SEC uh, because the regulatory framework wasn't there. And the, uh, the SEC assessed a $100 million fine. Shortly thereafter, BlockFi was not able to make the first $10 million down payment on the $100 million fine. They went on the auction block. They were sold. Two other companies with similar business models quickly went bankrupt. And the consumers who had funds on those platforms were left holding the bag in bankruptcy court. That does, at the end, so that was the, the response in the Wall Street Journal to what Gary Gensler basically calling him out, saying, stop invoking consumer protection. Stop invoking integrity of the markets. You're hurting the consumer. Regulatory uncertain, uncertainty creates havoc in the marketplace. What we need is clarity. So talk about that a little bit. What exactly do they need to do, these policymakers, to give clarity or to actually give more certainty overall to the crypto industry? So there's three ways you can get clarity. The first way is through regulatory rulemaking, uh, where regulators, they publish rules. 
um, uh, market participants weigh in and comment on those rules, and then you have rules moving forward. Um, the market, markets regulators in this country have shown no willing, willingness to do that in the crypto space. And I think they've shown no willingness to do that in the crypto space intentionally because they like the uncertainty, because the uncertainty gives them the power. So we're not seeing anything on the regulatory rulemaking front. The second way you can get clarity is through legislation. And there are a number of bills that are working their way through Congress now uh, to see if we can kind of clean up this mess that's been created in the US. Um, you have to be careful, though, because this is a very complicated space. And if you legislate without really understanding what it is you're legislating, and if you don't get those definitions right about what is a security or what's a commodity, uh, you actually can create more confusion through bad legislation. But I think there's a lot of good faith efforts that are going on right now, and, and, and we spend a lot of time uh, with policymakers educating them. And then the third way you can get clarity is through litigation. And uh, we are defending uh, the case that the SEC filed against Ripple, and we've said this since day one. We're defending it not only on behalf of Ripple, we're defending it on behalf of the entire industry. And we think that our case will provide favor, um, I'll, I'll strike the word favorable, will provide clarity in terms of how to define a digital asset. And the fundamental question is, is a digital asset regulated as a security, or is it regulated as a commodity or a virtual currency? We think it's regulated as it should be regulated as a commodity or virtual currency, and there's a lot of substantive reasons why that's the case. And um, so ultimately, I think the clarity may come from the litigation process, which would be unfortunate, but hopefully we can get uh, legislative clarity as well. So then how would we be able to create a system that protects and empowers the more than 40 million Americans who are a part of this new crypto economy. Are there specifics within the regulatory and policy perspective that you'd like to see happen in the US? Yeah, so I, I think a, a threshold point here that um, needs to be made and sometimes gets lost in, in all of the noise is I think the adults in the room in this space are not asking to be free of regulation. We don't want to operate in the Wild West. We're asking for regulation, but we're asking for clear regulation. Clear regulation, consistently applied, leads to predictable results, and that's what we need. But in terms of specifics, um, what we need is a faithful application of the existing laws. And the SEC, although they say we're just applying the law, really what they're seeking to do is through regulation by enforcement, remake the law. An independent agency or any agency doesn't have the authority to remake the law. Only Congress has the authority to remake the law. But ultimately what we need is a clear definition of what is a security and what is not a security. And the law kind of already gives that. The 1933 Securities Act, I've got a little, little legal wonky here, says the Securities and Exchange Commission, and it's right in their name, securities, they only have jurisdiction over securities, it provides a definition, a list of those things that are security. Traditional stocks and bonds, you own a right title or interest in a company through a share, a debt instrument, a note, and in that laundry list, there's something called an investment contract. And what Gary Gensler says, or what the SEC says, I don't want to make this personalized to, to Gary Gensler, but what the institution is saying is that if you buy an asset and you hope that asset rises in value so you can trade it in the secondary market, that falls under my jurisdiction. And that's not the case, because if it were the case, if I were to sell you a bar of gold or if I sell you a bucket of soybeans or if I were to sell you an Andy Warhol lithograph, and then I were to go out and to promote Andy Warhol lithographs under the SEC's theory, if you can sell that Andy Warhol lithograph or you hope to sell it at a higher price and I sold it to you, that's a security. It's not. What you need is an investment contract, which means you need a contract for an investment. A right title or interest in the entity that is selling you the asset. 
there has to be some post-sale obligation. After I sell you that Andy Warhol lithograph, I have to be contractually obligated to you or make some promise to you that I'm going to do something on your behalf that you can hold me accountable for if I don't do it. That is a security, and most cryptos don't fall under that definition. That's an asset, and it's probably an asset that trades in a spot secondary market, and that's more of a traditional world of commodities that falls under the CFTC's jurisdiction.